Moses Zupnik came to Sugihara with his Kurosawa visas in hand, requesting 300 transit visas for the Mir Yeshiva. I said to him, I'm a representative of the Mir Yeshiva. We want to go to Kurosawa, we just want to go through Japan. I still remember when he looked at me, when he said to me, all right, I give you the visas. He, he, I don't forget those things because he's still, uh, he's still all alive in me. He saw people suffering and he thought maybe he could help, and he helped. Pre-World War II Japan was a very corrupt country. They were emerging as a world power from 1900 to the start of World War II. Japan started to colonize a region in northeastern China, installing a major regime in Manchuria, later referred to as Manchukuo. Here, the Japanese government was exceedingly oppressive towards its people. In 1937, one of the most horrific events in Chinese history took place, the Nanjing Massacre. It was an episode of mass destruction and murder that ended with 300,000 Chinese civilians dead and over 20,000 Ch Chinese women raped. Like in Japan and China, there was chaos in Europe during the late 1930s. As the Nazis advanced through European countries, they killed millions. The Nazi party aimed at eliminating the Jewish European population. As more and more Jews were killed, thousands of families fled their homes. The Jews in Europe sought to evade persecution and get to the Caribbean. In order to escape, they had to pass through Japan. However, Japanese border officials wouldn't allow the Jews to go through Japan without a transit visa. The only option for their survival was to travel to a consul in Lithuania, run by none other than Shiune Sugihara. On the 1st of January, 1900, in Yaotsu, Japan, Chiyune Sugihara was born. He lived there for 17 years where he was exposed to competing cultural influences. His mother came from a long line of samurai whose traditions stressed loyalty to family and country above all else. Yet there was also the lure of more cosmopolitan opportunities as Japan looked outward. When Sugihara turned 18, he chose to go against his father's wishes to become a doctor and attend the prestigious Waseda University where he began diplomatic training. After graduating, he worked at different Japanese embassies throughout Asia. In 1924, Sugihara was stationed as a consul in Harbin, Manchuria, where he witnessed first-handedly the cruelties in Manchukuo. This is one of the major experiences in his young adult life that led Sugihara to do what he did in 1940. In 1932, Sugihara became the deputy consul of Manchukuo. Two years later, in 1934, he resigned and said, I resigned from my post in the foreign ministry because the Japanese dealt with the Chinese cruelly. They did not consider them human. I couldn't bear that. So instead, he trained to be assigned to Japanese embassies in Europe. During the same year in July, 32 Western countries sent delegates to meet in Evian, France. They discussed the growing problem of Jewish refugees in Europe. Most countries decided not to make special allowances for Jews seeking to immigrate from Nazi-controlled territories. The Japanese changed their policy to treat Jews as foreigners, which established a Jewish state in Manchukuo. Jews living there were also oppressed by the Japanese government. Then, when World War II began, Hitler and his Nazi regime invaded Poland. Two weeks later, Russia attacked Germany from the east, trapping Polish Jews between the two great powers. Over 15,000 fled to Lithuania, which at the time was a safe haven. In 1939, Sugihara was assigned to a one-man consulate in Kaunas, Lithuania, with his family. He said, I understand that my main task was to inform the general staff and the foreign ministry about the concentration of the German troops near the border. They wanted to know whether the German army would really attack the Soviet Union. In 1940, the Soviet Union annexed Lithuania, closing all consulates, including Sugihara's. Escape for the Jews was harder than ever. They now needed official documents such as passports, entry, transit, and exit visas. As the Nazi troops spread throughout Lithuania, Kaunas was no longer a safe haven. Sugihara was preparing to close his consulate and report to the Japanese embassy in Berlin for reassignment. He believed his work in Kaunas was over until the morning of July 27th. On that morning, Sugihara opened his consulate door to find hundreds of Jewish refugees at his doorstep. Yukiko Sugihara, Chiyune's wife, describes the scene. There were children, women, and young men. They were all hanging onto the fence trying to climb over it. 
but the security of the consulate was pushing them back. Sugihara asked for a delegation of five Jews to address him on what they were after. The Jewish delegation had come with a desperate request. Those people told me the kind of horror they would have to face if they didn't get away from the Nazis, and I believed them. There was no place else for them to go. If I had waited any longer, even if permission came, it might have been too late. Sugihara felt pressured by the mass of helpless yet hopeful Jews, knowing that they would be killed if not helped. Sugihara felt the need to go to any extent to do the right thing, no matter what the consequences. Sugihara knew that he had the responsibility to save the lives of the helpless Jews at his doorstep. He was their last hope. Before issuing the visas, Sugihara asked the Japanese embassy in Tokyo for permission. This was their reply. Concerning transit visas requested previously stopped. Advised absolutely not to be issued to any traveler not holding firm end visa with guaranteed departure exiting Japan. Stop. No exceptions. Stop. No further inquiries expected. Stop. Sugihara was faced with the dilemma. Save the Jews and put his family at risk or let the Jews be mercilessly killed. Sugihara was persuaded by the desperate stories of the refugees. I may have disobeyed my government, but if I didn't, I would be disobeying God. That was the day when an ordinary man in Shiyune Sugihara became a hero. In a 20-day span from July 27th to August 17th, Sugihara spent all of his time issuing visas. For weeks, Sugihara worked 18 to 20 hours a day issuing visas. It was a painstaking process as each visa had to be written out in complex Japanese longhand. Despite the great burden he labored under, the refugees all remember his aura of kindness, how he looked at each of them in the eye and smiled as he handed them their visa. After 20 days, the Russian government forced Sugihara to close his consulate. When his consulate had closed, Sugihara decided to stay at a hotel to get some rest. He left the refugees a note telling them where he was staying so they could find him and continue getting their visas stamped. Even though he was out of official stamps, he wrote the visas, hoping they'd be accepted. But why would Sugihara go through that much trouble to save people with whom he had no relation with? The only possible explanation is that he felt a connection with the Jews. This can be seen in one instance with Sali Ganor, an 11-year-old Jewish boy who had escaped with his family. The December of 1939 brought the holiday of Hanukkah. Sali decided to give the money he received to the suffering refugees, which he later regretted doing when the new film came out. When he went to his aunt's shop to ask for money, he saw Sugihara there, the first time he had ever seen a Japanese person. Sali remarks, I turned around and uh, that was the first time I saw a Japanese person. And he looked kind of strange, I'd never seen a person with slanted eyes. And he kind of smiled at me. I felt very comfortable with him. There was a certain aura of, of kindness about him. When his aunt refused his plea, Sugihara offered to pay for the movie. I said, I actually can't take money from uh, strangers, you know, not from family. And he said, no, so I'll be your uncle. Consider me your uncle, he said. Sugihara risked his career his life, and the lives of his family by defying Tokyo and issuing the transit visas. Under all the oppression they faced, the Jews were given the right to travel and to be free from persecution. They were given a chance to start a new life and reinstitute their religion. Sugihara felt it was his responsibility to help the Jews and that it was not for her own personal gain, but for God. The connection he felt with the Jews only influenced his actions more. His own struggles as a Japanese child, seeing oppression by the Japanese government in Manchukuo and Nazi oppression in Europe deeply influenced his actions later in life. Today, it is estimated that more than 40,000 people owe their very existence to Sugihara's heroic actions in 1940. In his old age, Yad Vashem honored him for his acts of courage with one of the highest awards to be received, the Righteous Among Nations Award. On July 31, 1986, Sugihara died leaving behind a legacy, including memorials that show tribute to his actions and his basic belief that every man has the responsibility to help his fellow man. A famous Japanese proverb that haunted Sugihara throughout his life states, even a hunter cannot kill a bird that comes to him for refuge.